Hey, everybody, how are you today? Did you have a nice lunch? All right, that's good, because I have a lot more for you to digest. So here we're going to talk about Justice Scalia and technology. Now, when you think Justice Scalia, you usually don't think technology. But today, you think tradition, the past, respect for your elders, things like that. But uh, in fact, Justice Scalia wrote a lot of important opinions on technology policy. And when you read Justice Scalia on technology, and you look at the way he interpreted the Constitution on technology, it's like he's a whole nother person. It's almost like there are two Justice Scalia's. There's Justice Scalia in the gay rights cases, uh, and then there's Justice Scalia uh, in the technology cases. And so part of my job is to explain why that is, and why, in fact, it's not as different as you seem, that there's a reason why he turns out this differently in the technology cases as opposed to the other cases. And I'm going to explain that. You get a fuller picture of what his jurisprudence was all about. So let's get started. Um, I, uh, I want to start with a case uh, called Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association. It's a case involving a California law that sought to ban uh, sales of video games that were thought to be too violent to uh, minors. Uh, anybody here play video games? Very good. Any of you playing them now instead of listening to me? Uh, in any case, uh, video games are very popular, and California was worried that, you know, uh, some of the video games were too violent. So they said, we're just going to ban selling them to minors. Uh, so the case goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court holds in an opinion by Justice Scalia that the ban on the sale of video games to minors was unconstitutional, violated the First Amendment. Um, there are a lot of interesting issues in this case, but for me, the most interesting thing, because you know, we're talking about theories of interpretation and originalism, is that he is on the opposite side of the other originalist in the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas. Uh, Scalia writes the majority opinion, and Clarence Thomas dissents on originalist grounds. So this is a great way to start in thinking about how Scalia thought about originalism. So what is Justice Thomas's argument for why uh, the law that restricts the sale of video games to minors is, is constitutional, right? Why they can do it. And the answer, says Thomas, is that you tell what the meaning of the First Amendment is by looking at the actual practices of the founding generation with respect to speaking. That is, if they thought something could be banned, you can ban it today. If they thought something was protected, you can protect it today. It's their practices that tell us what the First Amendment means. So he does this very elaborate opinion in which he talks about child-rearing practices going back to the 1600s, and he quotes Locke and Montesquieu and all these other folks, and he comes up with a conclusion, as from his study of history, that basically children have no First Amendment rights. Not only do they have no First Amendment rights, but it's also the case that you can't talk to somebody's child unless the parent gives their permission. So his view was, basically, this is an easy case, because this is a case about the sale of video games to minors. Minors don't have First Amendment rights, and therefore, at least, you need to get the parents' permission, and therefore, the answer is, easy case, it's all over. Justice Scalia begs to differ. And it's really interesting to see the way in which he thinks about the question. The way he thinks about the question is the following. Since the First Amendment is, says uh, Congress can't make any law abridging the freedom of speech, there's a general principle here. The principle is protection of public discourse, and that includes art and entertainment. In fact, it's impossible, he says, to distinguish between art, public discourse, and entertainment. People have tried. It just doesn't work. And so the question is whether or not this is an undue burden on the uh, right to engage in public discourse. He says minors have the right to engage in public discourse. They have the right to watch television. They have the right to see works of art. Um, and he, he makes a bunch of points about it. it would be ridiculous to think that, that if this were true, if you were 16 years old and you wanted to go uh, hear a speech by a patriots about whether or not we should revolt from Britain, that would be illegal. It would, you, know, you wouldn't be able to hear anybody uh, give a political speech. You'd have to get the parents' permission. In fact, if the kid wanted to go to church, the kid couldn't go to church unless they got a note from their parent. He said, this doesn't make any sense. So Scalia's approach is very different from Thomas's, and I need to give you a theoretical way of talking about it. Thomas says, the question is, what did the people at the time of adoption understand the text would do? How did they expect the text would be applied in some particular kind of situation? And I call that the original expected application of the text. Scalia, he is a textualist. He says, what does the words of the text mean? And if the text states an abstract principle, then we have to go on to ask how we apply the abstract principle in the current situation. So the way he does that 
is he looks to history. He tries to figure out historically what the principles are that are behind the text. And then he tries to apply those principles to a contemporary situation. So for him, the case is also easy. The principle is protection of public discourse includes art and entertainment. Children have rights too. Uh, and therefore, the issue is whether or not the state has met its burden of abridging freedom of expression. In this case, he decided they hadn't. Now, there were other ways that the state could have protected children without doing what it did in this particular case. But it's very important to understand that this account of originalism is so very different. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, so I have a problem with technology? Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> So this account is a very different account of originalism than Thomas's, and it's one which treats the text as basically stating not only rules, but also abstract principles and standards that it's our job to apply in the present. Another thing that's very interesting about this case is he has to, you may think of him as a textualist. We apply only the text, right? That in fact, he treats the text in a non-literal fashion. Why is that? Because, in fact, the word in the text is speech. And, of course, what are we dealing with here? Video games. So what he has to say is that the term speech should be understood at what we call in literary theory a synecdoche. That's like a synecdoche in New York. Synecdoche, which means it's, a, it's an example of something that stands for a larger whole, right? So speech is an example of communication that stands for a larger set of things called communicative media. And he does that. In fact, he says this in another book that he wrote, that, that when we come to something like speech or writings in the copyright clause, we treat them non-literally, because that's the only way to make sense of them and the principles that are involved. So if you just heard you know, the word on the street about Scalia, you would not imagine this would be the same guy. But this is, in fact, how he decided the case. And he disagrees with Thomas on this. That's very important, and you know the reason why? Because in this sense, my views and Justice Scalia's views don't really differ at all. I think the same thing he does. That is, the, uh, the Constitution states basic principles. They're often stated in terms of abstract assertions, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and our job is to figure out what the principles are by looking in history and apply them to change circumstances. That is the basic problem of interpretation when you deal with technology. I'll give you a second example, because I'm rolling, right? I got another example. This is a case called Maryland versus King. This is actually, Justice Alito said this was probably one of the most important opinions the Supreme Court would hear while he was on the court. What is the case about? It's real simple. Maryland has a practice. When you get arrested in Maryland, they take your DNA. They get a sample of your DNA, and they store it in a database. Why do they store it in a database? Because DNA is even better than fingerprints as an identifier. In fact, DNA is so good. Fingerprints, you just basically can match as the same person. DNA, you can tell a lot about a person from their DNA. Not only that, you can tell a lot about their relatives from their DNA, because you and your relatives share similar DNA. And so the real issue is whether or not the state should be allowed to collect DNA samples from the population. Uh, and in this case, they collected DNA samples not from people who have been convicted from crimes, but simply people who have been arrested for a crime, even people who were completely innocent. And so the question was, did this violate the Fourth Amendment's guarantees against unreasonable searches and seizures? And so in this case, once again, Justice Scalia, he's in the minority now, he's in the dissent, he dissents, and he says, this is not okay. The majority says it's perfectly okay because it's being used to identify who it is that we've arrested. And Justice Scalia says, that's hogwash, right? You, they, you know who the person is you've identified when you arrest them and you fingerprint them and you find out. You don't really need to take their DNA. The reason you're doing it is because you want to use, you want to create a database of citizenry that you want to use for all sorts of purposes later on. Now, it turned out that Maryland had passed a general statute of fair information practices that was going to restrict some of the worst, I think, abuses of privacy. So it's important to take that into account in the case, and I think that's what swayed the majority. But I think what Justice Scalia was worried about was that once you get a, a, once you get a, a list of DNA of all the citizens, there are lots of things that government can do with it, and that would violate the Fourth Amendment's guarantee against searches and seizures. Once again, he's treating the text non-literally, searches and seizures of persons, papers, and effects. Well, I guess you have to read the DNA as either an effect or a paper or your person, right? I guess that's how you would do it. But secondly, he also says there's a general principle. The principle is a principle against the invasion of particular legally protected interests, including privacy, but not the kind of privacy he's worried about in Roe versus Wade, a different kind of privacy, perhaps informational privacy. And the other thing that's interesting is he reasons from what we might call a paradigm case. By a paradigm case, I mean 
a case where we know the framers were really concerned about a certain practice. And the idea is we assume that that practice is still worrisome today, and we reason by analogy to that practice. The practice in this case was what was called the general warrant. The general warrant was you would basically go and you would get an authorization to just search everything in a person's house or everything connected to a particular crime, and you could just go scot-free anywhere and start searching things. The, the framers did not want that. They wanted to prohibit general warrants. That's why the Fourth Amendment is written the way he did, uh, it is written. And what Scalia says is, this is the same thing as the general warrant. This is the equivalent of the general warrant in a digital age or an age of DNA collection. What's going on here? It's very important to understand. He's drawing an analogy. It's not a necessary identity. And in order to draw the analogy, you have to make a set of value determinations about the role of law enforcement, about security, about the nature of the dangers that people might face, about the value of privacy and what it means in a current age. In other words, he has to make a whole slew of value choices, and he's not just simply following the Constitution, he's making sense of it in a particular age with very different worlds that the framers could never have imagined of. In fact, there's this wonderful point in the argument in the Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association case in which Alito is basically teasing him. And Alito turns to the lawyer arguing the case and says, I think what Justice Scalia wants to know is, did James Madison enjoy playing video games? What did he think of them? And of course, Scalia scrowls at him and says something else. But the point is, Scalia well understood that when you are dealing with new technology, you are not just simply laying the text of the Constitution next to the situation, and then biff, bam, boom, you apply it. You're making a whole set of controversial value choices of how to make sense of enduring principles against changing times. I'll give you another case, which is lots of fun. This case is called Jones. That's really its name, Jones versus the United States. This is a case where the um, uh, the police put a GPS tracker on a car. And then they use the GPS tracker to basically figure out the movements of the car everywhere as it's driving around. And in this case, the Supreme Court is unanimous. They unanimously decide that this violates the Fourth Amendment. I think the key moment in the, uh, in the oral argument came when they asked the government's attorney, could they do that to us? Could they do this to the justices and the, uh, without a warrant? And, uh, the, and the answer from the government attorney is, oh, yes, no warrant is required. That's the moment they lost the case, <laughs> right? But the really difficult question is, how do you show that this violates the Fourth Amendment since, after all, it's done in plain view, the car is traveling around in plain view, anybody can see it, where's your privacy interest? And so the way that Scalia solves this question is by going back in history and using history to say, there's not only an expectation of privacy but protected by the Fourth Amendment, there's also a guarantee against government trespass. Now let me just explain what that means. If you think about 1791, how would the government have invaded your privacy? The way it would have done is it would have trespassed on your property or into your home. It would have searched in your home and your papers and effects. So basically the way you violated privacy was to commit the common law tort of trespass. And what Scalia says is, reaching back into the past, this has never gone away, this is still very much part of what the law is, and now we're simply adapting it to a different situation, the situation now being the use of GPS. So many people criticized him for writing the opinion this way because they said it didn't really deal with the key question, which is, what's your reasonable expectation of privacy in the context of these new digital technologies? But I think Scalia could have said in response, that's a very big question. It's a question we're not going to be able to solve today. But I can tell you that there's this idea that we can trace all the way back to the framers about the right to be free from trespass, and that preserves some privacy values which should use it today. I should tell you, the same idea comes up in a later case called Jardine, which involves, which involves uh, music on, on uh, your, your iPhone. It's a case that actually involves a dog that is trained to sniff out drugs, and the police bring the dog onto the porch of the house and they use it, and the dog sits or signals that there's drugs in the house. They go back, they get the warrant, and then they search the house, and yes, there are drugs. Uh, and the question is whether or not it was okay for the police to use the dog by having the dog sniff around the house. And the court, in an opinion by Justice Scalia, says no, that's not, not okay. Why? Because you're using something that ordinary people wouldn't be able to uh, figure out, 
as, as a way of basically getting around the protection of the home, the privacy of the home. Once again, he uses a trespass rationale. But what's really going on here is instead of a dog, imagine it was a robot, right? A robot that had great uh, uh, sensory perception, sensory perception beyond what any human being would have. And whenever the police want to search a home, they just bring the robot by and the robot walks around the perimeter of the home. And then the robot basically says, go get the warrant, arrest him. Th many people would see this as a violation of their privacy. And indeed, there's another case called Ki uh, Kylo or Kilo in which in Kylo, uh, Scalia makes the same point about thermal imaging. What is he doing in these cases? What he's doing in these cases is he's saying that there's a text, but the text states a principle. You have to figure out by making analogies to the, hit, the past what the principle is, and then you've got to figure out, often in a very controversial way, how to apply that principle to a new situation. Okay, I got no problem with this. This is exactly how you should do originalism. But then, of course, the question remains, why didn't he do it in all the other cases? So let's take, for example, the gay rights cases, Lawrence, for example, or uh, Obergefell. You could have made the same move there. You could have asked, what's the purpose behind the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection of the laws? It's to prevent people from being treated like second-class citizens. Uh, it's to make sure that everyone is equal before the law. And you could have asked whether or not, and you could have used paradigm cases of the nature of the laws passed around the time of the 14th Amendment to show what it would mean to be treated as a second-class citizen or not to be treated equally according to the law. They would include, for example, restraints on marriage, among other things, but also uh, all sorts of restraints that limited people's ability to take a, have a job or people's ability to own property or people's ability to sue and be sued in court. And you could then make an analogy between those ways of treating someone as a second-class citizen and what it would mean to treat them as a second-class citizen today. Justice Scalia never does that in these cases. He never even goes down that road. He argues, very much like Justice Thomas, that if they didn't think it was unconstitutional at the time of adoption, it's not unconstitutional today. Well, this seems inconsistent with the way in which he talked about originalism in all these other cases. So is it an inconsistency or is there a deeper idea that unites these cases? I think there is, although I disagree with Justice Scalia. I think you should understand that he was not merely an originalist. He was not merely a textualist. He was also a traditionalist. That is, his view was that if a certain practice had been traditionally accepted and had been not treated as unconstitutional in the past, and there was a long history of the, of the practice being treated as within the state's power to regulate, then he was not going to disturb it constitutionally. So how is that consistent with these technology cases? Very simple. For somebody like Scalia, technology isn't about following tradition or not following tradition. New technologies disrupt our settled expectations of the way the world works. And when you have a disruption, it, you can't be saying that you're preserving the tradition because, in fact, you can't preserve the tradition. The world has changed because of the new technology. And so I think that in these cases of technological change, he was much freer to adopt a very different way of doing originalism than he did in cases where he didn't see a technological change at work. In those cases, he stayed as a relatively traditionalist kind of judge. But for, from my standpoint, many, many of the kinds of problems that we face today, if you poke at them a little, you can actually see there's technological change in the background. And one of them, of course, is the gun rights case, uh, Heller. It's interesting that when you get to Heller, we have a very interesting technological change at work. Here's the problem. The, one of the purposes of, of the Second Amendment was to allow ordinary citizens to stand up to a tyrannical central government. Not only to fight against foreign invaders, but also if the government got out of hand, if it became tyrannical, you could get the militia together and you could raise them up and they could basically make the government think twice. At one point in the opinion in Heller, Scalia says, well, you know, this is actually not a very realistic method of protecting liberty anymore. After all, the, the, you know, the government has tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, it has B2, you know, it has bombers. It has everything. There's no way that the kinds of weapons that folks had, that folks have in common use, could stand up to the kind of weaponry that a modern government has. And so then the question for him is, what do we do with the right? And the answer he gave is, well, the right also protects the right of self-defense in the home, and therefore we argue that even though the technology has made one particular purpose of this amendment, no longer is uh, viable, we have to protect the other. 
So he was making a choice, a choice about what to protect and what not to protect when conditions had changed. You could have done it the other way. You could have said, well, since the government now has much more powerful weaponry, we ought to allow the ordinary citizens to have very, very powerful weaponry too. But he didn't go down that road. Right? You can just see nobody gets to have a tactical nuclear weapons in their home. So the important thing to understand is that uh, if you look closely at a lot of uh, issues involving liberty or constitutional power, a lot of them have to do with technological change. When you have technological change, you can't simply rely on tradition. You have to make choices. You have to decide how to apply things that you're committed to in new situations. And sometimes you have to make very painful and difficult choices. A lot of what Justice Scalia did, in fact, could be understood in this way. One example that I'll close with, very simple. Many people have noticed that Justice Scalia had pretty much made peace with the New Deal. That is the vast expansion of the commerce power that came with the New Deal and the power to regulate uh, the economy, to regulate transportation, to regulate communication, not only nationwide, but within the states. In fact, this is a problem of technology, technological change and change circumstances. You see, when the framers thought about the right to regulate uh, commerce or to engage in federal power, they were thinking of a very limited national markets. And most of the uh, transportation was very difficult. And in fact, most things that you did locally didn't have very significant effects anywhere else. But once technology changes, once you get telegraphs and then railroads and then later airplanes and radio and automobiles and trucks and all the things we're used to today, much less the internet, right? Everything you do locally has economic effects nationally. And so then you have to decide which principle are you going to realize in a changed world. And the choice he made is the choice that was made during the New Deal, which is to give the federal government general powers to regulate the economy in the national interest, even though, in fact, it will intrude into things that before were only issues of state regulation. And I think this can be understood in terms of how do you apply old principles in new contexts with change regulation and what choices do you make, value choices, do you make when you're put to a choice caused by a change in technology. That is, I think, the general problem of how to do originalism in a constantly changing world. Justice Scalia, in many cases, I think, did it exactly the way I would have. Thank you very much.